Welcome to Real Clear Radio Hour, brought to you by the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I'm your host, Bill Frezza. This week, we talk criminal justice reform. In the second half of our show, we'll be joined by Mark Levin, Policy Director for Right on Crime, as well as the Director of the Center for Effective Justice. Up first, we're pleased to welcome Dorsey Nunn, founding member of All of Us or None, and Executive Director of Legal Services for Prisoners with Children. Dorsey, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Dorsey, you made your name leading the Ban the Box movement in San Francisco, trying to help release prisoners like yourself successfully re-enter society. I asked you on to talk about that movement, but I'd like to start with your personal history. You didn't take the easy path in life, did you? How did you get yourself sentenced to life in prison at 19 years old? I was convicted of first-degree murder under the murder felony rule where I was present where a person was killed. Unfortunately, uh, was caught up in the situation and I wind up being sentenced to life. That must have been hard time. It was extremely hard time. And it's probably harder right now that people that are serving current prison sentences because during the period of time that I went in, I think that there was some pretending that people really believed in rehabilitation. Mm-hmm. So I was able to take advantage of a number of opportunities while I was incarcerated. Essentially, I think that I basically learned how to read, write, and a whole bunch of other stuff in prison that actually helped me. You know, the first initial years was building up my body, and I lifted a lot of weights. But at a certain point, I figured out that I I didn't necessarily want to be a piano mover, so why did I need all the muscles? (laughs) You know, so I started going to the law library and other places and started learning different things. You were paroled in 1981 and then discharged from parole in 1984, a, a free man at last. What was it like trying to pick up your life again? I think that walking to the gate, I cried because I recognized that I had become a much different person than I was when I went in. Mm. You know, and some of the things that I needed to do when I was surviving in prison, I started reconciling some of that stuff. Well, why was I lifting weights? Because I was scared. Yeah. You know, and I wanted to buck up so like... Defend in case yourself. I got into a fight. Yep. Then on the way to the gate, I thought about all the pieces of things that I had seen during the course of my incarceration that had scarred me in a way. Mm-hmm. So you don't necessarily have to be assaulted. All you got to do is watch that stuff happen around you a lot, and you would feel the burdens of being assaulted. You may not feel sure. the physical part, but you would feel all the rest of it. And seeing people uh, a shot on the prison yards and seeing people stabbed and stuff like that, wasn't necessarily the most easiest transition into my adulthood. And I cried on the way out because I thought that prison was an absolute failure. And I thought that it compromised humanities in ways that as a society, we should be ashamed of. I walked out of prison and I enrolled in Cal State Hayward and I majored in criminal justice. Wow. And I didn't even know what criminal justice was. I didn't know that I was going to be going to college surrounded by everybody that was looking for upward mobility in in the field of law enforcement. Mm. You know, so <laughs> right. I, <laughs> so you're, you're going to college with a bunch of future cops. Yeah, I'm going to college to figure out how to dismantle this thing. <laughs> <laughs> Did you make any friends there who ended up going into the police? Uh, no, the person who probably I had the most common with inside of the first couple years of college mm-hmm. was a professor by the name of Henry Myers that was an ex-district attorney and an ex-cop because we could get to levels in terms of both of our experiences that a lot of people couldn't. He was a black person that had went a different route, but we had this nexus where we both had had experienced stuff, you know, yep. and that nexus was that we both lived in fear at different points in terms of our previous careers. So, Dorsey, what is this box that you've been campaigning successfully to ban? Oh, uh, Like when I got out, one of the things that struck me was that I don't actually think that crime is the first choice. It's generally a last option. If you give people other choices, mm. they generally would choose what's best for them, their family, and their community. I'm probably a little bit different. I think that when people don't rob me, break into my house, or do all the rest of this stuff, I think that it's not because I got a great police force, I think there's I got great neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, and other people outside my community seem to think 
what I need is more police. I seem to think I need better neighbors. <laughs> so how do you get better neighbors? In some parts, yeah, how you get better neighbors is providing opportunities that will give them access to some of the things that people commonly need, food, clothing, and shelter. <laughs> yeah. And how do you acquire food, clothing, and shelter? You have a job. <laughs> you know, it took me a long time to figure out that part of it, but it seemed like I was ahead of the curve, and I couldn't understand how come I was ahead of the curve. Oh, there you go. So, so what is this box? The box is that question on the application. Have you been arrested? Have you been convicted of a felony? Yeah. And basically what I think it is is a mechanism to screen people from the right to pursue their happiness or the security that they need. So that question, have you been convicted of a felony, I don't think was put there for anybody getting out of prison to actually secure a job. Wow. Well, how many Americans have a criminal record? I think it's about 70 million. Whoa. That's a lot. Maybe not all of them have a, a conviction history, but all of them have been fingerprinted, booked, and if you look real hard, you can see that stuff. What happens to formerly convicted felons when they successfully navigate the job interview process? You know, they haven't been blocked by this question, but their conviction comes up in a background check. The first thing that I need to pick up in this conversation mm -hmm. is that I'm a human being and a person. So when people start identifying me as a felon, an ex-offender, and all the rest of it, it doesn't necessarily equip me with the language to move forward. People don't give ex-felon jobs, they give people jobs. Mm. They don't provide housing for ex-felons, they provide housing to people. So what you call me in terms of language is extremely important. And as a person who have had that experience, and a number of people who have had that experience, when you call people derogatory terms, mm. expect that you're going to ultimately hit somebody that's going to buck up to you. So this is probably the first lesson that I want to teach anybody mm. listening, is what you call me is important. So if you don't call me a person and you call me these other things, most likely I'm not going to prevail in my effort to secure the full restoration of my civil and human rights. You know, journalists look at this as framing. You can frame a narrative in so many different ways. It's the same story, but if you start off with a different paragraph, people come to different conclusions. Yeah, so if you start off by shackling me with some of the most negative framing at the end of the day, then you're saying, how come I don't get the job? It's like, you know, maybe if you started out looking at me as an asset instead of a liability, you are probably actually offered it to me. So ban the box doesn't guarantee you a job. It just gets you in the door to make your case. It, it gets me in the door to make the case. And we did come up and say, don't ask the question, period. We came up and said, when do you ask the question? Right. And if the question is absolutely necessary. Well, you don't want a serial bank robber to be an armored car guard or a former child molester to teach kindergarten, No, but, right? you know, it's a whole, like when people hear ban the box, they think of just removing the box off of an application. And we think it's more complicated than that. We think that they should have a process in which you actually acquire information and how you use the information. So if you had somebody that was a bank robber, then perhaps you won't give them a job in the bank. That mm. would make sense, you know? <laughs> yeah. And if that person's a child molester, I don't want that person watching my kids. Sure. But at a certain point, when you uh, have this right there, you should be able to ask that there be a nexus between the reason that you're not hiring a person in the job. So if the person is a bank robber, should that person not be able to acquire a gardening job? Dorsey, do employers take on any additional liability if they knowingly hire a former felon? Most of the time, the places where we actually secured victories around Band of Box is more often in the governmental sector. Hmm. And I would challenge anybody to go to the county board of supervisors and sit there and see what is generating lawsuits in their cities. Right. It's not us. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're more likely to get dinged because the police beat somebody down false arrested somebody. So like when I'm sitting there, because I go to Board of Supervisors meetings all over the country, and I'm sitting there saying, I wonder how come I'm not hearing negligent hiring. Right. You know, I'm not hearing a whole bunch of lawsuits about negligent hiring. So the numbers don't speak to a lot of risk there. It, it doesn't speak to a lot of risk. However, I think that when you get around this question in the box, you could have a whole industry that has since evolved, particularly since 9-11, that are making money off of peddling fear. So, Dorsey, what's the status of the Ban the Box campaign since its earliest successes in San Francisco? Oh, since that time, I think that we didn't ban the box in probably 19 states in terms of whole states. I think that we didn't ban the box in over 100 municipalities. And I think that 
approximately uh, one third of the country or better is living in a, a jurisdiction mm-hmm. that have uh, banned a box. And by the way, the sky didn't fall. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we need to get to the question of, as a result of banning the box in these other places, did anything awful happen to you? <laughs> if it didn't, maybe we can say <laughs> you can actually incur this change without necessarily incurring a lot of risk. Dorsey, what are the legal and constitutional nuances of banning the box in public employment as opposed to dictating hiring policies for private employers? It depends on what side of that question you sit on. Mm. Because for all of these companies that's doing a business with the federal government that's using my tax dollars, I think I should have access wherever my tax dollars are spent. Okay. Because most of the time that people hear me and see me, if they don't see me as a human being and they don't see me as a taxpayer, then they're just assuming that the dollars that they're spending this government fund is only their money. My money is, uh, is joined in there, too. So I'm asking that the federal government issue an executive order banning the box for private contractors, which those private contractors actually control about 25 percent of the labor market. You're not going into a a local businessman who has no taxpayer dollars at work and insisting that that he ban the box. I'm insisting that that we end structural discrimination. I'm insisting on that. Or to put into place protections and the guarantee that you're not practicing some bizarre stuff that actually endanger human beings. Because what I actually do see ban the box is it's a public safety issue that need to be addressed. If people are not working and people are desperate, this is a challenge. So sometimes people ask me, what did I went to prison for? I say, I went to prison running from poverty. You work with so many former prisoners. Recidivism remains a big problem. How can you tell when people have truly turned their lives around? I believe the question for me is not how have they turned their lives around. That's a question that people normally ask. They ask Mm. ask it in different ways. They ask it, how do I know if you're a good citizen? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And my question would be, first we got to come to the conclusion that I am a citizen. Because if I'm not afforded the same things that you afforded. Get in the door and make your case is what you keep saying. Yeah, yeah, right? So if I don't have the right to vote in multiple states in the United States after serving the prison sentence, which generally indicate that you don't necessarily think that prison works as a society, sure. or else I would get that stuff coming out the door. You know, I understand that a 2009 study showed that people who have been out of prison for 7 to 10 years proved to be no greater risk than people with, with no record. Does that imply that it makes sense for some employers to maybe wait a few years before they hire a just-released prisoner? Hell no. Because, like, I need this person working as soon as this person can, can work. Because this person is not standing out there in isolation. This person is standing out there attached to a family, attached to a community, and attached to other people. As a result of the discrimination that's incurred by Band of Box, you got about 65 to $70 billion being drained out of marginalized communities because people are not working based on sure. a conviction history. So, like, do I want my community to be poor? Do I want my neighbors to be poor? No, I do not want that. And do I want desperation surrounding me all the time? No, I do not. And do I think that a person, uh, if a person hasn't, like you asked me, mm-hmm. how do you know a person turned their life around? For me, it's, it's the person trying to find a legal access out of an ugly situation when the most common factor and the most, it, it was easier for me getting out of prison to actually go and see Pookie to get a job than to go to any place else. Yeah. Pookie seen me as being muscular, he seen me as being potentially aggressive, and he seen that I could do some stuff. Now, could I have went to McDonald's or any of these other places and got the the job that Pookie was offering me? Because in some cases, the people who are not practicing discrimination got the worst jobs. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You know, know, and, and that's real. So when you ask me, should employers wait? two years, we need to ask, what is the social obligation to people doing business in this country? 
you raise an interesting issue about social obligation. The Ban the Box movement seems to have brought together some strange bedfellows from both the right and the left. I understand that the Koch brothers have put criminal justice reform high on their list of priorities, and they've banned the box in their own companies. Do you work with folks like them at all? I think the Koch brothers arrived at that position from listening to a formerly incarcerated person that did ban the box, and I think Durham, North Carolina, and his name was Daryl Ackerson. Mm. So, like, at a certain point, what's bringing these people together is that you got a body of formerly incarcerated people that are saying enough is enough, and we are not going to remain silent in our own oppression. We haven't even taken you to places because I think society is unwilling to go there yet. Because we think that after we serve our prison sentence, and if that was the prescribed punishment that was issued to us, that we really don't owe you nothing when we get out and we think that we should be equal to anybody else in society. And you have not came to the conclusion that what you should build into your sentence, that there should be a presumption of rehabilitation upon the completion of a sentence. Dorsey, what role does the failed war on drugs play in criminalizing so many young people, especially people of color? What I think it did was, first of all, fill the prison system, the jail system, and deny them opportunities in some cases of voting, employment, and housing. And, and, it, and it ruined, basically used it to ruin their future. Now, that's a good question that you ask me. Now, we need to ask another question because we're getting ready to march into the end of marijuana prohibition. Mm-hmm. And perhaps we need to actually look at the question, uh, how come Pookie was so available to go to jail but not turn a living on, on marijuana sales when it become legal? Hmm. Because we basically could be doing the same thing that we do as society in, in America is actually put in place structural racism and supremacy, and we may not recognize it. So if you track down all the numbers of people going to prison for marijuana, just as one example, and see who actually bore the blunt of that drug war, Mm -hmm. and it was people of color, then you say all the places that we legalize recreational or, or, or medical use of marijuana, see what the participation in the color scheme of that is, and you can actually see America playing out its ugly side again. It'll be interesting to see how that plays out. <laughs> if you look look at uh, Colorado as an example, it turns out to be a multi-billion dollar industry, and you got one black woman working there. We could look at this thing a little bit later while we're actually allowing the practice of racism and to continue in a real way and not address it. So the question is, what you're going to do with Pookie once you actually displace him and take his market? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You know, it's, it's been over a dozen years since you helped launch the Band the Box movement. What keeps you going? Uh, that I'm not finished with the work. I don't have the federal government uh, insisting that private contractors that they're doing business mm-hmm. with and using my money to do that business drop a clean application form in a, in, a, in a productive hiring process for people like me who pays taxes too. So until that question is addressed, how about this? The same thing that drove people to actually show up in Boston and throw the tea in the bay, it's the same thing that drives me. (laughs) In the time we have left, tell us a bit about the Legal Services for Prisons with Children organization that you also work with. Uh, I think the Legal Services for Prisons with Children is a 30-year, 38-year history. And a lot of stuff that helped come out of this office you don't recognize. Probably... We gave up maybe the first $25,000 we lent out of our unrestricted funds, critical resistance, the the first $25,000. And what they were able to do was hold a convening, and out of that convening, what we did was took an obscure term out of a Mike Davis book and introduced it to public speak. That term was the prison industrial complex. Hmm. What we did as uh, legal services for prisoners with children, we actually did policy work that stopped them from shackling pregnant women prisoners. As legal services for prisoners with children and all of us and we expanded voting rights in the state of California by 60,000 last year. As legal services for prisoners with children, we helped in long-term solitary confinement in places like Pelican Bay and in the state of California. And more importantly, As legal services for prisoners with children, I could be one of the first formerly incarcerated people in the nation that sits the head of a public interest law office with an auto law degree with attorneys working for me. Dorsey, are you optimistic that one day America will no longer lead the world in the percent of its population that it puts in prison? 
I'm very optimistic. It took me 20 years to get them to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> We're making progress. <laughs> You're making progress. At least, hold it. Hold it. Think about this election. If you think about it in the real way, when was the last time you heard somebody jump out there and say, we need to be tough on crime? Yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're right. We could, be changing, we could be changing the whole paradigm. And what I need the listeners of your program to, to really understand is that my employment, my housing, and my ability to take care of uh, my children is a public safety issue also. And that I should be entitled to public safety also. If it's anything that I learned when I went to prison and probably at the age of 19 and 21, if there was a prevailing lesson that I learned out of that experience, when I thought that I was the most self-righteous is when I made my greatest mistake. Dorsey, thanks so much for coming on the show and sharing your perspective with us. Please keep in touch. Thank you for having me and take care. That was Dorsey Nunn, founding member of All of Us or None and executive director of legal services for prisoners with children here on Real Clear Radio Hour, brought to you by the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I'm your host, Bill Frezza. You can check out Real Clear Radio Hour on Facebook or follow us on Twitter at Real Clear Frezza. And while you're at it, take a look at realclearmarkets.com, my go-to place for diverse views on political economics. We'd like to thank our long-term sponsor, Old Boston Restorations, for their support. Old Boston is a boutique property management company in Boston South End. Ahead, we'll speak with Mark Levin, Policy Director for Right on Crime, as well as Director of the Center for Effective Justice. We'll ask Mark how his work to rationalize prison policy helps both nonviolent offenders and the taxpayer. Stay tuned.